We are talking about the Tripura Rasya, this amazing tantric text of the Samaya tradition. The Tripura Rasya is a delightful conversation between Lord Gattatreya, teacher of teachers, and his student Parshurama. In our last session, we talked about the different kinds of enlightened beings. Sages are not all alike, like little robots, and they have, quite contrary to our expectations, different kinds of personalities. In our last session, you saw that some sages devote themselves to writing scriptures and others, like King Janaka, carried out his duties as a king and was still above all those worldly pleasures and matters. This chapter Chapter 20 is called The Appearance of Sri Tripura Sundari and Her Teaching. In this chapter, the goddess herself appears and we have the privilege of listening to her teachings. The chapter begins, as it always does, with conversation of Tatatreya and Parshurama, in which Tatatreya often narrates different stories to illustrate the teachings. Verse 1 onwards, Tatatreya said, Let me tell you an ancient story. Listen, once upon a time in Satyalok, the highest celestial realm, the sages were engaged in an earnest conversation about knowledge. Participants discussed the subtlest philosophies. The sages present included Sanaka, Vashishta, Pul Pulastya, Pulaha, Kratu, Brigu, Atri, Angira, Prachetas, Narada, Chavana, Vamadeva, Vishwamitra, Gautam, Sukra, Parasara, Vyasa, Kanva, Yikashyap, Daksha, Sumanthu, Shankha, Likita, Devala, and many others. During that debate, they discussed the secrets of the knowledge beyond. Then those great sages asked Brahma, the creator, Lord, we are all considered Janis, we are all knowers of the absolute and provisional truths, yet our states of attainment are different. Some of us are blissful in Samadhi all the time, some of us are engaged in contemplation, some of us are absorbed in devotion, and others are performing skillful actions. Some of us are busy conducting our duties. Please let us know which is the highest category. So we see here that the sages themselves have doubts and come to a higher authority. This requires some clarification. We are talking about Satyalok, the highest of celestial realms. And what are the Lokas? Most of us are aware that the human body has certain energy points and throughout the body these different energy points some are more intense and, and um, stronger and the others are milder so you see that the most dense energy points in the body are the chakras which are 
all aligned along the spinal cord. It starts with the lowest of chakras, which is the root chakra. It goes to the next which is Swadhisthana, goes to the Manipura chakra, which is also the navel chakra, then to the heart center, to the throat center, to the Ajna chakra between the eyebrows, and finally to Sahasrara chakra, the thousand petaled lotus at the crown of the head. These are the very powerful energy centers within the body. These energy centers exist within us and we or you, your body is the microcosm. It's a world within itself. For those of you who have a scientific bent of mind, you know that there are a lot of bacteria that live in the body. And I don't mean bacteria as in some disease but there are colonies within the body that exist and are very important part of the body. There are blood cells, all of which seem to have a life of their own. All these different cells are reproducing, dying, regenerating, and the body is really and truly a world of its own. It is the microcosm. Just as there's a microcosm, there's also a macrocosm. The macrocosm are levels of consciousness. Just as the lowest chakra in the body is the lowest level of consciousness, and if a person is very focused on this lowest level of consciousness, his mind is very deeply attached to material objects, to the external world. As the individual goes to higher levels of consciousness, he goes to different levels of consciousness within the body. It implies that the chakras at higher level are also open and are active. Just as the chakras indicate levels of consciousness, so um, there are similarly different levels of consciousness in the macrocosm. And these levels of consciousness in the macrocosm are called lokas. So chakras in the microcosm, lokas in the macrocosm. So lokas are the parallel of the chakras at a macrocosmic level. And these lokas are basically those planes of consciousness to which you will go when you are disembodied. If your mind was very much focused at Vadistana level, then you will go to a certain loka. If your mind was focused very much at the heart center, you go to a higher loka. And those who reach the highest loka, satya loka, are the ones who have had access to the highest of chakras, ajya chakra and beyond. So when you are disembodied and you are in Satyaloka, it does not mean that you are liberated. You are still in duality. You are still in this world, so to say. It may not be this earthly plane or this plane of existence that you know now, but it is a world which is of beings of a different Nature. They are disembodied beings, but they have a, their personality. To understand this, we also need to 
understand the Mandukya Upanishad as well as have a deeper experience in meditation itself. So we see that the sages at this highest level are still not quite sure about certain matters and they have questions. Of course, the questions that the sages at this level ask are totally different from the questions asked by a beginner. And we find that the discussion is about what is the highest kind of sage? Who, who is a superior sage? Are those who are skillfully performing actions, like Lord, uh, King Janaka, who performs his royal duties, or others who remain continuously and permanently in Samadhi. So which is the highest category? So the answer. Questions like this, Brahma thought, these sages do not have firm faith in me. Thus he said, O oh, seers, I myself do not know this. The Lord Maheshwara is all-knowing. He must know the answer. Let us go to him. Thus accompanied by all the sages, Brahma went to the abode of Shiva. Vishnu was also there. After greeting him, Brahma asked the sages a question. Hearing this, Shiva understood Brahma's question and realized that all the sages were not endowed with firm faith and everything he said would not be acceptable. They would think according to their understanding. Thinking this, Mahadev said, O oh, sages, I am not sure about the answer. Let us meditate altogether on the Supreme Goddess, the source of knowledge. By her grace we can know the deepest secret. So we see here that just as the sages had their own doubts and were discussing and debating amongst themselves, when they go to Brahma, Brahma realizes as well that the sages do not have full faith. From this we can see that a sage is not what a lot of people believe they are. They are not perfect beings. They are and have human qualities. They may not be embodied, but they have human qualities because they are not perfect. So the sages also have doubts or do not have firm faith. So Brahma says, okay, let's go to Lord Shiva. But even Lord Shiva saw that the sages did not have full faith and that they would understand things according to their own level of knowledge. Now this is a issue for all teachers with all students. It is the nature of the human mind that we understand things at our level. We cannot think, understand things that are beyond our level. Think about a little child who is two or three years old. Can you explain things to the child that maybe this child's elder sibling understands? So let us say a two or three year old child has a sibling that is in school. And the child that's in school is very worried because he is supposed to learn numbers and he's supposed to learn to read and write. And he feels maybe even a little bit under pressure. But the two or three year old child doesn't understand this. He thinks, oh, school is only fun. I just go there and play with friends like my, my elder sibling does. And a, a child of six or seven will see that his father or mother, they get money out of the bank. <laughs> they take a card 
and they put it in this machine and money comes out. How amazing, how wonderful. And with this money we can buy toys, we can buy clothes and we can go and have a good time. And the child does not realize that mother and father have to work a lot in order to get the money in the bank in the first place. He thinks, or she thinks, oh, it's so easy. You just need a card and with the card I can get money and then I can do whatever I want. So the child understands things at his level. Same it is with teenagers or adolescents. They think they know everything, as most adolescents do. Believe that. And when the mother or father try to explain things, they get irritated because they think they know everything. But, in fact, they don't. They do not know how difficult it may be eventually to get a job, how much they have to work in order to save money, how to save the money, how to buy a house, simple things which you have learned over years and years of experience have to be also learned by the teenagers. It's a part of growing up. It's a long, winding process. So we can see from this, even an adult is like a child because he remains at a certain level of consciousness. And to a sage, such an adult may seem like a child. And yet again, the sages appear to be like children to Lord Shiva, to Vishnu and to Brahma. These deities, uh, some people like to imagine them to have certain forms and they worship them and we think of them as gods but what are gods? They are nothing other than disembodied beings and beings of a higher level of consciousness and that which is of a higher level of consciousness we cannot understand, we cannot even imagine just like a six or seven year old child cannot imagine how it is to go to work when his mother or father go go to the office or go and work somewhere. They just cannot imagine how it is. It seems so incredible. Oh, they may think, oh, my father is so strong. In reality, maybe the father is not strong at all. But for the child in the family, the father can do things that he cannot. And so he thinks his father is very strong. But then as he grows up, he finds out, oh, there are many stronger men in the world. <laughs> and in comparison, the father is probably very weak and very ordinary. So also... <clears throat> those at the very highest levels of consciousness see even the sages as children. And so now all of them are meditating to get the grace of the great goddess Tripura. Verses 17 onwards. Hearing this from Mahadev, Brahma, Vishnu and Mahadev himself, with all the sages present in the assembly, started meditating on Tripura. With the result that self-illuminated Tripura, who is the purest and the mother of speech, appeared. There was a sound like a thunderbolt from above. O seers, tell, tell us, for what purpose you have meditated on me? Express your desire. I never let my devotees' desires go unfulfilled. A few words on this. So all these deities are now meditating. This means that the deities are also 
beings at a higher level of consciousness. So while you may want to imagine Shiva being blue colored with uh, living on Mount Kailash with snakes, cobras around his head, uh, neck, and Brahma having four heads, etc. Um, these are symbolic uh, images. The reality is that these are beings of light or pure conscious or consciousness, higher level of consciousness, and they are not yet universal consciousness, pure consciousness. Tripura, the word Tripura is of two parts. Three means the number three and Pura means cities or parts. So she's the goddess of the three parts, three cities or three states. And what are these three? These are the three states of consciousness. Waking, dreaming and sleeping, deep sleep rather. So she is the one who is the goddess of these three states. And what does that mean? That means she is the one who is aware of all these three states. As you are awake right now, you're, you may be aware that you are awake. But when you go to sleep at night, you are not aware generally that you are dreaming. You are not aware that you are in deep sleep. If you would be aware and you would be established in that awareness, which is called pure consciousness or Atman, then you would experience Tripura. You would experience the three states with full awareness. And so the goddess is none other than pure consciousness or Atman or universal consciousness. And therefore the goddess is actually not female nor male. Because we have a mind, we live in the world, we have duality around us, we tend to think in terms of male and female. The reality is that Atman of your consciousness is neither male nor female. But because we are not able to relate to such abstraction, we like to give it a gender. And then we like to decorate this gender with symbols. These symbols are very useful. They teach us a lot. They are good teachings. But they are symbols. And the reality is, this is nothing other than pure consciousness. It is Atman. It is Paramatman. So there was a sound of thunderbolt. Why, do, why is there a sound of thunderbolt? As we approach pure consciousness, we hear this sound. It sounds like thunder. It is a deep vibration. And this is a clear sign of pure consciousness approaching. It is a bit like following this river. You know, when you follow the river towards the source, there is this loud sound, the river. And you keep following it. As you keep following it, the sound fades away. At the source, there is no sound. The sound is in the plains or the waterfall. But as you follow the river, as you keep going further and further, you reach the source, the river becomes completely silent. A few years ago, I went to Gangotri and further on to Gomuk, which is the source of the Ganges. And as we started walking from Gangotri towards Gomuk along the river which was partly very deep down because as we were climbing it was like a drop and the rivers 
the river was, was in spades, it was uh, very loud. It was so loud that it was really after a while, uh, I, I must thought, I need some silence, this is so loud. And this loud noise keeps continuing until you reach the source, and that is with all rivers. So, the sound of thunder is a clear sign that you're moving now inward, and as you go further inward, the sound would in fact disappear and you would be in really in deep silence, a silence that you have probably never known before. where you become the witness. This sound, this vibration, has also got a name. It is called Om. Om is the unstruck sound. For any sound, you need to strike two things. So when you clap, that's the sound of clapping. It's one hand striking the other. If you think of drums, it's the sound of the hand striking the drum, the surface of the drum. If you take any musical instrument, take a guitar or sitar, string instruments, it is the string, the finger striking the string, which creates a vibration, and that's the sound created. The vocal cords also are like strings and it is this vibration of these vocal cords which is causing the sound to appear, our voice to appear. So all sounds are struck caused by the striking of two objects. But OM is an unstruck sound. That is why it is called Anahat Nada. Anahat Nada is sound, Anahat is unstruck. Hat is struck and Anahat means unstruck. So the unstruck sound is OM. And when you go that deep into consciousness, all desires can be fulfilled. Verse 21 After listening to Paravak, the unstruck sound, Sage is prostrated in front of her. Brahma and all the others started singing her praise and reverence. The sages prayed to Tripura, the goddess of knowledge itself, reverently. O Mother Divine, highest of all, Sri Vidya, with folded hands we bow in front of you. You are the cause, sustenance and annihilation of this universe. O Supreme Goddess, we prostrate in front of you. You are the most ancient. You were never born. Therefore, you are ever fresh because you never go to decay. You are all in all, the existence of all, knower of all and bestower of happiness. You are beyond all phenomena of the universe, untouched by the universe, unattached. O oh, Mother Goddess, again we bow to you. We pray to you from all directions again and again. You are form and formless. You are the mother of fulfillment and knowledge. You are the fruit of real sadhana. You are the seeker, you are the adept, and you are the highest of all adepts. Kindly explain everything systematically. Again, we bow reverently in front of you. So the sages praise Tripura, Tripura who is none other than the pure consciousness. So remember that the deities Brahma, Vishnu, Maheshwara, these are not pure consciousness. These are the higher levels of consciousness, but they are not pure consciousness, which means that these deities are still a part of duality. Only she, pure consciousness, or Brahman, as it is often called, Paramatman, as it's also called, or Atman, as it's called, is beyond duality. And such one who is beyond duality is the cause 
and is the sustenance and annihilation of the universe because it comes from pure consciousness, it goes back to pure consciousness. It is the most ancient, what shall be more ancient? It was never born and it shall never die. It always is, was and will remain. And so, this pure consciousness has form, but it's also formless. Because everything around us is pure consciousness. But it is also a formless aspect of pure consciousness. So, you are the seeker and you are the adept. So, basically, everything is pure consciousness. Universal consciousness. That is the Supreme Mother. Verses 29 onwards. At the request of the sages Tripura, the Supreme Mother, the very embodiment of knowledge, spoke compassionately in her clear and authoritative voice. Sages, listen to me. I will systematically explain. I will churn the ocean and give the nectar to you. This whole universe is like an image in the mirror. It is born, it is there, and it annihilates itself. That which is seen by the ignorant as the world is realized by the yogis as pure knowledge. One who is self-delighted and remains calm and undisturbed, great devotees call it one absolute and blissful. They worship that Supreme Mother according to their knowledge, with pure love and devotion, that which is the very basis of the senses and eternal states, without which nothing exists, and that which is the subject of the scriptures, that self-illuminated reality is my real nature. I am called Tripura. So, here the goddess says, I will churn the ocean and give you the nectar. This is in reference to a mythology that many of you may know called Samudra Manthan. In this, the ocean of milk is churned and beautiful gems come out of this and gems as in precious things come out of this, not just jewels, but precious things come out of this. And one of the main things that comes out of this ocean of milk is nectar, amrit, it's the nectar of immortality. So what is this ocean of milk? That's the world. That's the unconscious mind. And when you churn this, something comes forward from deep inside and that nectar of immortality gives you health, gives you wealth, gives you everything that you need. Please remember that these symbols are not just some nice stories that you, that you hear and forget. They work at the unconscious level. They are teachings in a time when there were no printed books. And so teachings were always handed down in symbolic form. And when you teach these stories and narrate these stories to children, they understand them in their own way at an unconscious level. As we grow older, we begin to, I like to use the word wrestle. You try to understand this and solve this problem by contemplating on it. It's a mystery. So these stories are very mysteriously explained in the form of symbols and as you keep grappling with these stories you you may want to know what this means you can understand it perhaps at an intellectual level as it has become now very common uh, we see a lot of books being published which explain the symbol the meanings of gods and goddesses. Most of these books are very intellectual. But when you are a meditator, and you're, or you're an, 
part of a tradition which explains these, interprets these, then you have a different understanding of these symbols. And so we see that one who meditates turns up the unconscious mind and finds that deep treasure within, which is pure consciousness. And this nectar of pure consciousness will give you real health and wealth. Not this fickle kind of wealth which comes and goes, monetary wealth, but a far deeper wealth. There is many kinds of wealth, not just financial or monetary. There is the wealth of mental, emotional stability, the wealth of friends and family, the wealth of mental and physical health, the wealth of courage, wealth of success, wealth of talent, wealth of spiritual attainment. So these are the different forms of wealth. And all this comes to you with this nectar. So the mother is now explaining that the universe is like a mirror. It's an image in the mirror. It doesn't really exist. It seems to exist and we believe this all is reality, is true. But those who realize through self-knowledge, they see this world as transitory, fleeting, and those who are caught in this illusion they are ignorant. It's like you go to a magic show. When you're a child, you believe everything. When you're an adult, also you get fooled by the illusion, even though you know somewhere, <laughs> you know it, that the magician didn't cut up the woman into two parts. But you are fooled by the illusion, all the same. So as you grow up, you may read the scriptures and you may know intellectually that yes, this world is an illusion but you have not found out how the illusion is working. In order to understand how the illusion works, you have to become the magician. Only the magician knows how he cut the woman into two and then joined her back again. So, to be established in pure consciousness, to become universal consciousness, only then you understand how the others are living in the illusion of the world. And some of you have understood theoretically, yes, the world is an illusion, but I still don't know how, how it works. I have not understood. I keep falling into this illusion all the time. And I get emotional, I get upset, and I'm afraid. And... The others are even like children. They are so into the illusion that they have no doubts. Like children who see the woman being cut into two and get scared. And so <clears throat> we need to become the magician ourselves. So all this world around us is made up of nothing other than the three states of consciousness. And the one who is aware is Tripura. Far beyond all the worlds, there is an ocean of eternal bliss. In the center of that ocean, there is an island of gems. In the midst of that island, there is a temple with brilliant illumination. In the inner chamber of that temple is a throne on which is seated Mahatripura Sundari, the great Mother Divine, with her five aspects. O highest of seekers, that is myself. Similarly, Sadashiv, Ishana, Brahma, Vishnu, Rudra, Ganesh, Skanda, Indra, the goddess of wealth and other presiding deities who are worthy of worship as well as the Rakshasas, Devas, Nagas, Yakshas and Kinaras are all different aspects of my external nature. So, we see there is external nature and internal nature. The internal, pure, real self is nothing other than pure consciousness. But there is an external nature. And the external nature is all these forms. Even the deities are part 
of this. The Yakshas, Devas, Nagas, these are all different kind of beings. All the traditions in the world have talked about different kind of beings. So in the West also there was a time when people talked about angels and fairies and demons and orgs and all these kind of creatures. And those days people even believed in these creatures. No, nobody believes in them. But these creatures, just as the Indian version of it, that is the, the Asuras and the Devas, etc. These are all beings at different levels of consciousness. They are part of the microcosm. These are the different spiritual dimensions. Those who have become adepts in meditation are able to gain access to these different spiritual dimensions. But most of the time we do not have access to these different spiritual dimensions because we are very very stuck at the purely external level at the lowest chakra. Verses 41 onwards. In all these aspects, deluded by my own illusion, men know me not. I am worshipped by all, and I bestow the fruits according to their worship. There is none adored like me, and there is no wish yielder like me. People receive the fruits according to their sadhana. O seers, my powers are limitless. O seers, I am one absolute, everlasting and self-existent reality. I do not need any support. I am present in all forms of the universe. My light shines forth throughout the universe. By being seen in all the forms of the universe, I do not renounce my true nature. This is the wonder of wonders, which makes the impossible possible. O seers, if you contemplate on my powers, you will know that I am the existence of all. I can be realized, but I am beyond comprehension. By my own primal shakti, it seems I am born and will die in the world. Again, it is as though I become the disciple of my Guru Dev, realize the knowledge of Atman, attain freedom, and again and again attain moksha. Without any help or means, the universe continues to function. In this way, my faces are multifarious. Having thousands of eyes, even the Shesha cannot count my countless powers. Listen, let me give you the essence from the grain of my powers. The world continues to function. So, to elaborate on this, the goddess Tripura is speaking. She is none other than universal consciousness. So she says, I do not need any support. She is the support. Just as we need a certain foundation to build a house, you cannot build a house without a foundation. So also this world needs a foundation and that is the foundation. Pure consciousness. And so, pure consciousness is born, pure consciousness becomes a seeker, pure consciousness practices, does sadhana, pure consciousness attains freedom and attains moksha, pure consciousness comes again and again, again and again. And without any means or help, it continues to function. And without this pure consciousness, there would be no world. And this, these forms are so many, so infinite, they are countless. They cannot be counted. How many beings there are? Just 
Think of the number of ants there are in the world. Just these tiny little ants, there are billions of them, far more ants in the world than there are human beings. So imagine how many beings, how many creatures, how many life forms there are just on this planet. So all this is all a part of the world of illusion created by your consciousness. Verse 50 onwards. According to the philosophy of duality and non-duality, my knowledge varies. According to form and formless, the fruits also differ. The philosophies of duality are many because the existence depends on the existence of someone. That is called meditation. Duality is like a dream or a kingdom in the dreaming state. Knowledge bestows duality according to the law of the cycle of providence. Knowledge of the phenomenal world is of various types. As has been said before, fruit of meditation on Brahman is moksha, but in reality, pure knowledge is called one absolute without a second. I am beyond all and above all, Sri Vidya, without pure devotion for a long time, who can attain the knowledge of the Absolute? That which is pure beyond all the phenomenal world is the knowledge of the Absolute, and to contemplate on that is freedom from duality. When the mind and its modifications flow towards the eternal center Atman, O seers, pure Atman is realized. By following the sayings of the Vedas and by making sincere efforts, pure Atman is known. And when that Atman is not identified with the body, it is called real knowledge. Real knowledge is that through which duality disappears. By attaining knowledge of the Absolute, nothing remains unattained. So here the Goddess distinguishes between two forms or two kinds of knowledge. There is the knowledge of the Absolute and then there is the knowledge that binds. Shiv Sutras say, Ranam Bandha, knowledge binds. And you might wonder, oh, didn't we all want to seek knowledge? Yes, but there is a knowledge that helps us to live in this world. So there is Paravidya and Aparvidya. And this Vidya which we learn to survive in the world and which helps to acquire knowledge of different kinds so that this life can continue, the knowledge we pass down to our children so that they can read, they write, they become members of society and are productive and well-adjusted. All this kind of knowledge, however wonderful it may be, will not liberate you. Only absolute knowledge, real knowledge, will liberate you. And that is knowledge of the self, of Atman. Atman is not body, it is not part of duality, and this is the only real knowledge. And only through this knowledge, duality disappears. What does it mean, duality disappears? The world does not disappear, the world will continue. But for you, Personally, these dualities disappear. So you see things differently. You see things in a way that others don't see. And so those who are witnessing, they look so, look at the world in such a different manner that the rest of the people cannot relate to such an individual anymore. He seems otherworldly. He may think, find things funny that you get scared, you get worried and he's laughing about it, he's amused. Just like children who are playing in the sand pit, make a castle, they get so attached to their sand castle. They get very upset when another child comes and kicks that sand castle and breaks it. And they start howling and crying. And the adults, they actually find it very funny 
and they are amused but they don't show their amusement and they try to console the child but sometimes an amusement comes out and you start laughing and you say come on don't don't be don't be such a baby don't cry and the child gets very angry and says why are you laughing at me don't laugh and that's really how it is we adults are so attached to our little toys in our big big sand pit called the world all the things we make we make a house and we get so attached to it it's nothing other than a castle in the sand pit made of sand so that house will also collapse one day or it will deteriorate it will run down it will be in ruins and you think you made a wonderful house for your children but your children don't want to live in it when they grow up they say no we don't want to live in such a broken house we will build our own house and so it is that you realize that it was all transitory you got attached to that house and the others the seers and sages are laughing at you and saying hey didn't you realize that this house is not really real so real knowledge is that through which duality disappears and by obtaining knowledge of the absolute nothing remains to be attained so there is no more purpose of life you are there without having any reason you experience joy reasonless joy verse 60 oh great seers the knowledge through which all limitations disappear that alone is the real nature of atman the same atman is one absolute without a second just as after enlightenment that ancient doubtful nature disappears in exactly the same way the clouds are dispersed by the force of the wind that is real knowledge verse 61 is a very very um, interesting verse and it, it gives us some insights that ancient doubtful nature disappears what happens in enlightenment what ha- enlightenment is in a very vague word it's an english word and it has different meanings for different people it is often used to mean awakening the awakening is actually different it means you get a glimpse once and then you fall back into your ignorance and enlightenment actually means that you are established in in this knowledge you remain awake you never sleep again you never fall into that ignorance again however in english it is often used to mean different things so in the scriptures we have very special technical language we have different levels of samadhi we have finally kevalya so we see that enlightenment or kevalya or establish being established in our true nature happens when the ancient doubtful nature disappears so we see that these doubts are ancient even the sages though they're so evolved still had doubts so when this doubtful nature disappears it is through enlightenment just as the wind will make the clouds disappear so enlightenment will completely remove this doubtful nature from the source like roots being pulled out after most of the desires are removed if any desires exist at all those desires are harmless like a snake whose fangs have been removed that is knowledge beyond so again some wonderful imagery imagine snake whose fangs are removed now snakes the reason why we are really afraid of snakes generally is because they are poisonous and they have these fangs and when they bite you and inject you with that poison that 
if you do not die, it may still have other other repercussions. It can seriously harm you. You you become paralyzed or you lose an arm or a leg or whatever because that has to be amputated. So that is the reason why we are afraid of snakes. Now snakes are a bit like desires and desires can also be very harmful because you keep on one desire fuels the next. But with enlightenment most of the desires are removed and if there are any desires these are relatively harmless. They do not have much of a power anymore. They are like a snake whose fangs have been removed. Verse 63 The result of this supreme knowledge bestows freedom from all miseries and makes one fearless. This liberation is the fruit of pure knowledge. Fear has its root in desire. And after attaining the knowledge of one absolute, how is it possible for duality to exist? The moment the sun rises, darkness is dispelled. So wonderful imagery again. The moment the sun rises, darkness is dispelled. There is no more darkness. So also, once pure knowledge, supreme knowledge shines forth, you become fearless. What is there to be afraid of? There is only one. There is one absolute. There is no other. And fear itself has its root in desire. You are afraid because something you desire may not happen or may not come to you. The desire may not be fulfilled, and therefore you are afraid. But when you have no desires, what is there to be afraid of? So, there is no more duality. O seers, after getting freedom from the sense of dualism, fear vanishes. That which does not exist, but seems to exist, causes fear. The acknowledgement of that which is non-existent is subject to destruction. How can you remain fearless in such a state? Meeting ends in parting. Therefore, the fruits received also go to decay and destruction. If there is anything to be obtained other than Atman, then there will be fear. But the realization of that self-existent Atman is a state of fearlessness. This state has been identical, been called identical with the self by all wise men. This is moksha. It occurs when the knower, knowledge and that which is attained become one. Then alone one is completely free from fears and attains liberation. Also the entire mind and its modifications along with shallow knowledge, vanish. And so we understand that the state we want to aspire to is called the state of fearlessness. That is Atman, pure consciousness. That is Moksha. Everything has vanished, the entire mind and its modifications. And vanished does not mean that, that nobody can talk to you anymore. But you don't have a handle anymore. You don't have attachments anymore like others have. So if somebody scratches your car, you don't get so upset. Other people get very upset and the car gets a little bump on it and they get crazy. But you don't because you say, okay, fine. That was going to happen any, anyway at some point of time. So, so it is that the mind of such a seer becomes so different. We cannot relate to it anymore. We cannot understand how such a person can be fearless. But that is possible. Because you start seeing things differently. This is a good place to stop. We'll continue in the next time. And um, understand what the Goddess says in this matter. A matter of pure consciousness. And even the sages 
have now come to realize that they have some doubts and it's these doubts that keep them back from pure consciousness and keep hold them back from liberation and see you next time bye bye everyone